Hello, everyone. Welcome to Chrononauts, a science fiction literature podcast. As usual, I am JM, and I am here with Nate, and we are going to be traveling into the air once again, like we did last time. So I uh, just wanted to start by saying welcome to any new listeners, and thank you to those who have been listening and will hopefully continue to listen so long as we keep it interesting, right. which we intend to do. Yeah. So we are on uh, many platforms. We are on Anchor.fm. We should be on Apple Podcast and uh, a few other platforms. We're also on YouTube. And I know we've got a few new subscribers on the YouTube channel. So thanks for that. Funny thing, we actually lost our YouTube channel briefly. It was reinstated very quickly. We don't know what happened. but uh, Yeah, I have no idea. I suspect it's actually because uh, of our Hollow Earth episode. I think there may have been some trigger words oh, in there. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I yeah, okay, maybe. I, I guess it's a, it's a mystery. <laughs> it is a mystery, yeah, we don't know. But we're just happy that it, it, it didn't take much struggle to get it reinstated. But if you happen to not be listening on YouTube and you do enjoy the podcast, maybe just subscribe to the YouTube channel anyway because it is a good platform and the more subscribers we have, the more the name of Chrononauts will be disseminated for all, all the people who want to know about science fiction literature and history sure. uh, thereof. And we also have uh, Blogspot, chrononautspodcast.blogspot.com, where we will occasionally post things about the stories, including some translations. So definitely check that out. We posted last time The Air Battle by Mr. Man himself, Herman Lang. <laughs> yeah. That is the first posting of this book online in digitized form. Right. So, although we're not going to claim that it's an amazing book, some of you might still be interested in reading it because it's kind of something a little bit special. I complained about it a lot last time, and I think we, you did as well. So, there were a lot of things to say, and sometimes I think that when there's a lot to say, it actually sort of justifies the whole experience, even if yeah, it wasn't absolutely. immediately pleasurable. Yeah. So, we're covering a few uh, works today by two different authors. We're going to start out by discussing... The Angel of the Revolution by Mr. George Griffith, popular writer of his day. And we also have a couple of works by Rudyard Kipling, who is one of the more famous writers that we've covered so far on the podcast. And I'm looking forward to talking about him because... Oh, absolutely. Boy, oh boy, he sure is an interesting person. So... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But why don't we start with Mr. Griffith? Yeah. So like last time, we were covering stories revolving around aircraft and things like that. So since we've already done a tech history background in the last episode, if you haven't listened to that already, we suggest that you do just to get the sense of where these stories were published, because both the novel Angel of the Revolution and the two Kipling stories were published before World War I, before a lot of the major advancements in flight were made. Angel of the Revolution was written before heavier-than-air flight was a reality, the Kipling story is slightly afterwards, but before there were any kind of commercial air travel or anything like that. So flight was very much in its infancy when these stories were written, more or less the same time frame as last time. So getting into the first work that we're covering, Angel of the Revolution, was written by George Chetwind Griffith Jones, who was born in 1857 and died in 1906. The biographical material that we're pulling for this comes from Stephen McLean's intro to the Victorian Secrets republication of Angel of the Revolution. Yeah, smart name there, guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a relatively recent republication. It seems to be the only critical edition that we could find readily available online. The work does seem to be ignored largely by contemporary critics, aside from scholars of science fiction and getting into it i think we'll see why that is but i think michael moorcock i don't know if he actually said anything like very specific about it but i think this was one of the inspirations for his yeah it uh, definitely was it definitely was oswald baseball warlord of the air yeah this trilogy i think it yeah. was. and from all accounts those are better novels than this was yeah because they're probably a bit more self-aware right yeah but we'll get into that in a little bit as for griffith his father was a clergyman and McLean described his mother as a spinster, although that's a rather odd term to apply to yeah, a married woman. So I don't really know what he was <laughs> getting at there. But she was from Bath. 
Through his father, Griffith was educated in both Latin and Greek and had access to his massive library where he read the works of Dickens, Walter Scott, and Jules Verne. And I think we can definitely see elements of both Walter Scott and Jules Verne in Angel of the Revolution. Not much Dickens, though. No, I wouldn't say much Dickens. There's like a very superficial care for social issues, but it's very, very strange. And again, Uh, we'll get to that later. His father died in 1872, and he went to a private school for 15 months, and afterwards became an apprentice on a Liverpool merchant vessel, which made its way to Australia, where he deserted ship and worked several odd jobs there for a period of a couple months, and eventually went back out to sea, traveling the world a total of three times. He returned to England at age 19 and began teaching at Worthing College. It was around this time that he started writing using the pseudonym Lara, where he contributed to the Secular Review and published a few volumes of poetry under this pseudonym. He married Elizabeth Brierley in 1887 and turned to journalism as a way to support the family, moving to London in 1888. Here in London, he found a job working for Cyril Arthur Pearson, initially addressing envelopes for Pearson's Weekly, but shortly afterwards started contributing content. Angel of the Revolution was serialized in Pearson's Weekly between January and October of 1893, and its sequel, Siren of the Skies, was serialized between December of 1893 and August of 1894 in the same publication. So with some financial success from these two novels, Griffith was encouraged by Pearson to travel more, and he wrote a travel memoir for Pearson called How I Broke the Record Around the World in 1894. After 1897, Pearson commissioned H.G. Wells to take care of the scientific romance piece, whereas Griffith turned to more adventure-style writing. In 1899, he moved to Littlehampton so he could have more access to good sailing conditions, Apparently, that was something he really loved. And he left for an impromptu trip to Australia, and on the voyage, he wrote A Honeymoon in Space. After 1904, his health started to rapidly decline, and he died in 1906 of cirrhosis of the liver. So I think he was a pretty heavy drinker. Sounds like it. Relatively young that he died. He wrote about 20 novels that were published in his lifetime, and a few posthumously. It seemed like he was only going for maybe about 10 years. I just, yeah. He was quite productive during that time, though. Yeah, he was. And it seems like he wrote a lot of these kind of bestseller, more mass market type novels that were yeah. geared towards sales rather than, I guess, any kind of grand artistic statement. Yeah, and it's too bad. Cause yeah. This I mean, there, there's definitely there. some things to enjoy in mm. this novel. Yeah. Although there, there's definitely a lot of problems with it, too. Angel of the Revolution, McLean considers the first bestseller of scientific romance, which, again, is kind of a strange claim. Perhaps he meant English scientific romance, or maybe he yeah. considers Jules Verne to be something else entirely. I would assume not, and he yeah. was definitely a bestseller, so yeah. uh, it's hard to say. Yeah, but as far as English authors goes, he predated Wells by a couple years and was certainly the most popular author of scientific romance from England until Wells came on the scene. And Wells quickly eclipsed him in popularity, and I think it's pretty easy to see why. But still, there is some enjoyable stuff in Angel of the Revolution. So, getting into the novel itself, Angel of the Revolution was influenced by Maxim's progress in aerial navigation from 1892 and his musings on heavier-than-air flight. The Wright brothers were still about a decade off, so it was all still theoretical at this point, although, as we heard last time, several very important advancements had been made in the field. The novel was serialized between January and October in weekly installments, so they must have published 
around two chapters in each issue, though I'm not exactly sure how much it broke down. There's about 50 chapters in the novel, 49 proper chapters, and an epilogue. And it was later published in late 1893 by Tower Publishing in book form. And reprinted many, many times afterwards. The edition on Project Gutenberg is the fifth edition, and it was illustrated by Fred T. Jane, who also wrote a bit of science fiction himself. And apparently the illustrations are quite striking. Someone was talking about those earlier. I... Yeah, the illustrations are pretty cool. Jane seems to be a relatively talented artist, or at least as far as illustrating pulpy scientific romance goes. We haven't read anything yet by him on the podcast. We probably will in the future, so we'll see if he was as good of an author as he was an illustrator. But the actual novel opens up with Richard Arnold, who is more or less our main character throughout, although it does bounce around quite a bit. But he's from the South London tenement, and he's an engineer and inventor of some sorts, and he has solved the problem of aerial navigation. He was an orphan, and he was always haunted by this particular problem, and came into a few thousand pounds, which he put into his experiments. He focuses on the problem of weight to power, and solves it with this system that he develops involving the collision of two different gases. So it's a novel propulsion system that never really existed in the real world, and wouldn't really be a factor as far as actual flight goes. It seems to be somewhat different than jet propulsion would be several decades later, but it's an interesting yeah. novel system regardless. It involves a whole lot of spinning propellers and wheels. Yeah, yeah, and yeah exactly. the collision of these two gases, which Arnold slash Griffith does not identify at all. Yeah. So. It just seems to be a super efficient energy source, more so than a burning coal or more so than a combustion engine, which would come around a little bit after this was published. Again, as we mentioned in the last episode, in the real world, a lot of the people looking towards heavier-than-air flight put most of their research towards the problem of weight to power, like Richard Arnold is considering in this novel. But where the Wright brothers were successful is they put a lot of their research on control. And that just doesn't seem something that Arnold is concerned with here. But regardless, he develops this little model that flies perfectly around his apartment. But his funds are totally exhausted, and he has no resources to actually produce something tangible aside from this model. And he barely has enough money to eat. But he goes out to eat anyways so he can think of an idea better on a satiated stomach. So at Ludgate Circus, he's reading a newspaper. And he hears of the murder of this Russian colonel of the Imperial Police. And the colonel had unearthed this nihilist conspiracy and has a cross cut on his forehead, which is the mark of the terrorist. The murder is a total mystery, but the newspaper mentions that Lord Alanmere was a passenger on the train. And that was the first really strange detail that struck out to me from this novel is like, why would a newspaper mention who else is on the train? when a murder <laughs> takes place. <laughs> yeah, especially if it's a politician of considerable yeah, prestige who doesn't right. probably want to be. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, <laughs> this jogs Arnold's memory, and it turns out he's an old acquaintance of Arnold, and Arnold thinks that he's going to hit him up for some money. Yeah. So our, our character may be uh, penurious and low on funds, but he's certainly classy enough to know Lord Alanmere. Right. Well connected <laughs> yeah. through some means, though I don't know if we're ever no. given an explanation for his birth, given that he's an orphan. I think he might have just dropped this plot point. Yeah, I mean, it seems like they went to school together, but how that could even be, like, how that would even be, I'm not really sure. Yeah. So, yeah. There's uh, a lot of things in this book that are just not, like... <laughs> right. George doesn't really care, so we have to not either, or else we'll yeah. drive ourselves, you know, silly worrying right. about them because it's and, just like yeah yeah and i think part of that is the fact that this was serialized in a weekly across 10 months so he might not have had the entire thing planned beforehand that he might have just been writing as he goes and just yeah. making shit up as he goes along i mean i'm a big fan of writers like robert e howard who also produced like a lot of work in a very short time yeah but i think somebody like him tended to keep things a lot shorter Mm -hmm. So when he got repetitive and stuff, he didn't notice as much. Yeah, right. I think this is because this is like 
a long serial, like a really long yep. serial. Yeah. We have some some real structural issues coming up a lot of the time. So Yeah. Yeah. So this is the longest novel we've covered since The Mummy. This is roughly 150,000 words. Both The Mummy and The Last Man were around 175, which this would translate to, I think, around 450, 500 standard pages. So it's not the longest novel in the world, but it's definitely long enough where when it starts to sag in the middle, and this definitely does, it does yeah. feel like a bit of a slog at times. But the novel takes place in 1903. So that is 10 years in the future from when this has been written. And in those 10 years, enormous progress has been made in electric lighting. And there's these large hydroelectric turbines installed on the Thames. North London is very prosperous, whereas South London is poor and dark. And Arnold finds himself walking around for hours, unsure if he's going to be able to get the money. There is an open offer, however, from the Tsar of Russia for one million pounds. And what the Tsar wants is he wants some breakthrough aerial technology. And Arnold is just kind of musing aloud that he'd rather destroy his secret than give it to the Russians. And he instantly recognizes the destructive power that this changing technology will have on warfare. And it would definitely tip the strategic hand to any nation that possesses it. There's an awful lot of anti-Tsarist sentiment on display in this entire book. Right. The Tsar and the Russian Empire is pretty much portrayed as the symbol of despotism and tyranny throughout the entire novel. And mm -hmm. that might not be too far from the truth. There was certainly a lot of anti-Tsarist sentiment, not only in Russia, but abroad at this time. Yeah, and this kind of ties into something that's revealed at the very end of the book, which I think we'll, we, we should probably get into then. Yeah, right. But yeah, like it, it's a thing. Griffith's reasons for being this way are a little mystifying to me. I mean, like, because he doesn't like capitalists yeah. either. And I am i don't know, like, if he's really suggesting what I think modern audiences would think he's suggesting. So, yeah. anyway, we'll carry on because for now I'm just sounding really vague. But like, Yeah, the politics yeah. are quite strange, but uh, they do come in a little later. But one thing that is repeated from the beginning is that Tsarist Russia is bad. Hmm. But as he's musing about this... He's overheard by this random person on the street who says he's also of the same mind. Yeah, because when you when you say that you're gonna kill yourself and you you're like sitting on a bench and you're kind of announcing it to the world so yeah. that anybody <laughs> can come by and either stop you or encourage you, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so he goes back with his rich new friend and he has this enormous mansion, which is in stark contrast to Arnold's really meager dwellings in South London. And this rich new friend is named Maurice Colston, who is a bachelor and an idler, a dilettante, and a good deal else that is pleasant and utterly useless. And he's also a socialist. Arnold tells him a story, and Colston asks if he really meant it regarding destroying his invention rather than selling it to the Tsar. And Colston tells him that he's an agent of the Tsar himself, and he will have his million. And this prompts Arnold to walk out, but Colson says that he was just testing him to see if he was honest, and he proves it by ripping off his shirt and showing him <laughs> his back, where he got tortured by the Russians. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Colston tests his honesty by being dishonest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you will. Right, sure. Arnold is then invited to stay the night, and they sit down with a nice cigar. And the next morning, Arnold had been dreaming about an aerial war. And the aerials, much like in the air battle, have an umlaut over the E. So I think that was probably the common spelling of things at the time. Or at least, I think it's pretty unlikely that Griffith would have read the air battle. But you yeah. never know. It's not used so common nowadays, but they call that a ligature. And it's like, it's usually between two vowels in... Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, makes, it makes sense, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess I had just assumed it was a stylistic choice for the air battle. But it doesn't seem to be the case. And no. it seems to be frequently written. That way I think, I think when time. you saw words beginning in AE, that was often, or, or with that combination of letters, you would often see that symbol. Yeah, right, right. So that's what we have here. And in the morning, Colston tells him that he hopes he's initiated in the Brotherhood soon, and says that he's working on their behalf for the cause. He tells him that Ainsworth died getting involved in a bribery scheme with the Russians, and that the inner circle learned of the plot and that Ainsworth was executed by two Brotherhood members, 
members of the Metropolitan Police Force. And that Coulson justifies this by saying that Ainsworth had betrayed his country. And he moves on to the business about the aircraft and wants to see Arnold's working model. And says that if the executive approves, he'll be asked to join the inner circle at once. So that's quite convenient for Arnold that he gets to skip all that introductory stuff. He will have unlimited funds and command, but Arnold says he has certain conditions. Namely, he will reveal to no one the secret of his gases. And if any attempt is made on this, he'll blow everything up, including himself. That he will only consent to open warfare, no civilian targets. And while Colston says that only the executive can approve of this, Arnold tentatively agrees, and Colston hints that war is soon to come, which gives Arnold a chill. They go back to Arnold's place, and Colston is horrified at the squalor, though Arnold says it's in palace compared to some of the other dwellings in the area. Arnold shows him the working model, and Colston is quite impressed, and says that with this they could easily conquer the world. Colson hands over 10 pounds as payment for inspecting the model. They pack up Arnold's stuff and are taken around by a cab operated by the Brotherhood. Each cab has a telephonic arrangement communicating with the roof. Couldn't tell if this was a wireless mechanism or a mechanism that predates wireless. It doesn't seem like the actual aircraft we see later on have any yeah, kind of which communication. Yeah, which is weird because yeah, he talks about actual cables like hidden yeah. in the cab, so yeah. I think that it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I assume the cables were from like the the cab's roof to whatever apparatus they had yeah. in the dash and then whatever signal it sends out would be wireless, but that might not be the case, so maybe there's like some elaborate cable system going to all the cabs. Uh, I don't know. It, it's a little bit unclear and a little bit convoluted, but the cabs have this cool communication system that's all futuristic and lets everybody know what everybody else is doing. So Yeah, and they're basically spying all over for the Brotherhood. Yeah. And this is something like it's a yeah. recurrent motif throughout the book. Yeah. Like they, they always have people in the right positions to do what needs to be done. Yeah. So Colston tells him that any treachery is instantly found out due to this network. So they're able to root out any counterinsurgents or counter agents from other intelligence organizations that are trying to infiltrate the Brotherhood instantly. Yeah, I really like their password system, too. Yeah, It's yeah. not techy, but it's like kind of clever, I guess. I'm sure yeah, it was absolutely. modeled on something. But yeah, so essentially what happens is one person asks a question in one language and the reply has to come in a different language. Yeah. So even if it's the right words, more or less, if it's not the correct tongue, then the interloper will instantly get shot. Yeah, right. Yeah, so you better make sure not to make any mistakes or... Yeah, uh, don't slip up if you're a polyglot. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, the languages they speak in are English, German, Spanish, and Russian. And they provide text in German and Spanish, but for whatever reason, they didn't provide the Russian text to, I guess, assuming that not too many English speakers would know Russian words. It's probably a reasonable (laughs) assumption, but... When they get to the terrorist headquarters, they are shown into this room with illuminated hallways by electric light, and they go through the multilingual password system, and they are permitted entrance to the main room, which is decorated by these gorgeous paintings in a really horrible, realistic style. People are being flogged, officers and soldiers are abusing the common people, and Arnold is told by this mysterious voice that they are paintings representing the real-world scenes in the civilized Christian world. During this time, Coulson has vanished, but around the table sit 14 masked, indistinguishable forms. This mysterious voice says he would spend the lives of millions of people to end society, as it's better than the 30 million lost in the last century of bits of territory. The squabbling over borders, he doesn't really see any point in this at all. And his main concern is overthrowing tyranny and instituting a society that's just for all. And he's told that the terror is an international secret society underlying and directing the operations of the various bodies known as 
nihilist, anarchist, and socialist. So here's where we start to really get into some of the wacky politics as Griffith lumps all of these three political ideologies together, even yeah. though they don't really have too much in common, aside from the fact that sometimes some of them blow stuff up. Yeah, I really don't understand, because, spoiler, but these guys are the heroes of the book. Yeah, they are. But the way Griffith talks about them is like, it makes them sound like, the the kind of villains that would have been popular at that time in yeah, like pulp, yeah, right. pulp stories and yeah, stuff. Yeah. So I guess in a way you could say it's a unique perspective. I don't know. It's it's just but instead of seeming clever, it doesn't really seem to amount to anything. No, it doesn't. So and this is definitely seems... not an intelligent look at some of the political ideologies, even through a a reactionary lens like Dostoevsky did, or glorifying them like some of the contemporary Russian authors had done at this time. But anyways, these people are present everywhere, and they want to bring down society that creates such an unjust order. And after explaining this philosophy, the question of whether he is to join is put to Arnold. And Arnold says he will if his terms are accepted, which the Brotherhood agrees to, so he takes his oath to the Brotherhood of Freedom. And after the initiation, they reveal themselves through their cloaks. There's nine men and five women, and they all shake hands. Two women in particular capture his attention. One has the hair as white as the snows of 70 winters, even though she's in her early 20s. She says she is a woman being depicted as flogged by Russian soldiers, and her name is Rodna Michaelis. That was in one of the paintings, the horrible paintings yes. seen earlier on. Right. And he had that was the one that had captured his attention. Right. He's like, wow, who's this beautiful woman? This is terrible, right? Yeah. There she is. Her. Yeah. <laughs> so what a coincidence. The other woman is Natasha, who has no last name. And she's younger, in her late teens perhaps. She says she is the daughter of Natas who has dark hair, blue eyes, and she says she's very eager to see the airship. Again, Natas is this mysterious leadership figure who is just kind of alluded to through the beginning of the novel. The name is an obvious reversal of Satan. Yeah, so feel free to interchange Satan for Natas whenever you feel like it, because that's kind of <laughs> All that's right, yeah. something that makes this book a little bit more fun. Yeah. Especially yeah. as they keep calling him the master and stuff like right. that. Right, yeah. Like... <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I thought he was going to do more with this than he actually does. Uh, McLean says the name is kind of significant because he's like an avenging angel. And yeah, okay, I guess. But I don't know. There's really not too much similarities between the Natas of this novel and like the Lucifer depicted in Milton or no, something like that. No, I mean, like you that. think maybe he would have chosen the name Lucifer because it almost seems more appropriate. I mean, I yeah. know they're kind of the same thing, but like like in Paradise Lost, there's there's definitely this kind of distinction made. Like Satan is fallen, whereas right. Lucifer is like the one that brings light. So I don't know. I don't know. It's just weird. Yeah. <laughs> Many weird we things. do get a Lucifer later, but we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. So Natasha's very interested in this new airship. They go to this secret passage underground to a gun range, and Rodna's in charge of the armory. Arnold begins assembling an apparatus with assistance, and he says it's a combination of Jules Verne's Clipper of the Clouds and Higher Maxim's airplane. So Clipper of the Clouds appears to have been a rather popular novel during the time. It's, I guess, mid-period burn. So it was written in the 1880s, roughly 20 years after his most popular works were written, yeah. but certainly a couple decades before the end of his life. I didn't realize, but I read the sequel like when I was really young, which yeah. is Master of the World, but I didn't realize at the time, I think, that it was a sequel. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, the reviews on it seem to be mixed, I guess, but it does seem to be well-read during the time, like pretty much everything else Byrne wrote. And yeah, I mean, Wells refers to it, too, in the air battle. Yeah, he does, yeah. He, he says it's by George Griffith. Right, so it makes me wonder, yeah, even more so if Wells was taking a shot at Ugh. Griffith calling him a cheap plagiarist of Verne, because apparently mm. there is a scene that comes later that is 
very, very much inspired by Clipper of the Clouds, but uh, we'll point that out when we get there. So he muses a bit on some of the failures of Maxim's airplane and goes into his design, which has a vertical takeoff and landing system. The model rises vertically off the table and is controlled remotely by some lever. And this idea of remote control is wireless, and it does come in before the experiments of Lodge and Bose, never mind Tesla. This demonstration greatly impresses everybody, and he will be known as the Master of the Air. And he decides to name the first airship the Ariel, A-R-I-E-L, but must be able to produce drawings from memory, because they are too valuable to write otherwise lest they be stolen and disseminated elsewhere. Yeah, maybe by somebody like Bert Smallways. Exactly, yeah. You never know. <laughs> you never know, yeah. <laughs> and they plan on meeting with the chief in Russia. And they're going to go to Petersburg with Natasha and another woman. And at dinner that night, lots of songs are being sung. Natasha sings the hymn of freedom in numerous languages. It looks like Colston is in a romantic relationship with Rodna. And Arnold is very taken aback by Natasha. Colson says that nobody knows Natasha's true identity, except for Rodna and Nicholas Roboroff, the president. And also he says he'll explain the picture someday. Roboroff is a apparent Russianization of Robur, being the main character of Clipper in the Clouds, yeah, whose initial title was Robur the Conqueror. So I, th I think it's another a deliberate nod to Vern here. Well, there's actually a lot of Russians in the Brotherhood. Like, the Brotherhood yeah. is mostly run by Russians. Yeah, more or less, yeah. So kind of I thought that was kind of interesting, and I guess it kind of negates the anti-Russian sentiment <laughs> a little right. bit. Yeah. Again, it's it's hard to know what these people's goals actually are. Like, yeah. it doesn't really seem like they have any, which is one of the problems in the book. Yeah, park, it, but... it definitely is. Though those problems manifest themselves later on. I think... During this point in the novel, I was very much enjoying this. Yeah, me He too. really sucks you in from the beginning, and it feels very exciting, even though some of these events sound a little silly even as you're reading them. Yeah. It's, it's fun, and it's definitely fun at this point, and it feels like it's going somewhere. And you have this interesting precursor to this like shadowy intelligence organization that I think you'll see a lot through big franchise sci-fi oh, through the 20th century it's james bond now. and all those other types of franchises employ this but yeah. i'm not sure how much of a precursor you can find to something like that in earlier works i mean there's obvious earlier airship novels like burn there's obvious future war novels like the battle of dorking and some other titles that followed afterwards, but this whole like secret society intelligence network that's omni powerful and omniscient, it seems kind of new here. Yeah, I mean it's certainly new in, in terms of a podcast. And yeah. I was thinking of I was thinking of things like reading about the secret agent from Joseph Conrad, but that actually came after. So Yeah, right. It's and then you already mentioned Dostoevsky. I don't really think that that's like, it's not that kind of organization, and that's kind of the point. Like, they don't really have a lot of... They certainly don't have sway over world events the way these people do. Oh, you mean in Demons? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's very localized to... Uh, I forget where that takes place. But yeah, no, th that's like a group of like four or five people. And mm. th that's more or less how personal obsessions and extremism can bring down everything. But no, it's nowhere near of like a world-controlling organization i do think that this was a popular like this was an emerging popular subject at the time yeah i think that arthur conan doyle might have written something about secret societies i think i think that this wasn't really all that far from a lot of and this kind of ties into the book as well but feelings about like secret especially unfortunately jewish cabals and stuff like that right that control a lot of the world behind the scenes right and I guess there are also other occultist societies like Madame Blavatsky and yeah. things like that. But this takes a different tone. There's really no religion involved in the society, even though it's not explicitly atheistic. It's not, 
I guess, overbearingly Christian either in the same way that the air battle was. It's not overbearingly Christian, but there are a couple of instances where, where Christianity suddenly seems to like appear and yeah. it just, it seems very significant, but not really commented on. So it's <laughs> right. It's, it's kind of weird again, I think. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's, it's inconsistent in a lot of ways, which we'll see in a bit. So Arnold learns that five people have been responsible for the plight of Radna, three of which are dead, and the two that are still alive are the governor and the prefect of the police. And Coulson says that they'll be killed soon, and mentions that their chief is a secretary to the English Assembly at Petersburg. This person that they are meeting is Arnold's friend, Alanmere, and he's got a bit of a mystery, too. Natasha's yeah. called the Angel of the Revolution for how fatal her charm is. And Colston says she's the perfect prize to be won after commanding the air. Yeah, this was kind of deflating, I thought. Like, the romance yes. elements were already getting kind of silly. Right. And Arnold is talking about how infatuated he is by her. And yeah. Colston just, he's just kind of like, oh, everybody feels that way. Right. And kind of yeah. Like, <laughs> and, I mean, th this is the first of many instances where the women are just set up to be won like prizes and trophies. They're not really characters of their own agencies. They're characters for Arnold and Colston to win when they've done something yeah. good in the novel. And there are times when Natasha seems kind of badass, but it turns out her father is just kind of directing things right. from yeah. behind the scenes. So. Yeah. Yeah. so yeah, it's another way that this is a little frustrating. But Arnold wakes up refreshed the next day, and he's thinking of Natasha, and he goes to... Chelsea with Princess Oronovsky, where she's posing as her niece. So these are the two women that are going to be accompanying him to Russia. Natasha excels at breaking the hearts of Russians, and her name for this mission is Fedora Daryl, and she's not to be called Natasha in public. Yeah, and here we have what almost feels like, it almost feels like there's a part of a serial missing. Yeah. <laughs> So I, yeah. I'm not that the book isn't long enough, but right. geez. Yeah, there, there's a bit of a time skip. Yeah, the time skip is weird because, like, it's set up like, okay, this is this sort of exciting adventure that they're all going on. Yeah. And, and like, they get to, they have to play roles and stuff like that. And, like, oh, so that's where we're going. But then we right. just skip right over it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is where the, the structure starts to get. I, I noted it down, right? At the, uh, so, chapter nine. Chapter nine, everything goes pear shaped. Yeah, I don't know. I was on board with it still. I'll mark out the point where it started to get a little weird for me. But before the time skip, Arnold learns that there's a French engineer who's developed a war balloon that meets all the criteria for the SARS offer of a million pounds. And what they want Arnold to do is examine the French war balloons, determine its strengths and weaknesses, and basically figure out how they can counter it, what they can do against it. And they're going to go to Petersburg with it. Colonel Martinov will give them their passports and will be executed later for his role in Rodna's flogging. But he'll at least do something useful before he dies. So that's <laughs> yeah. nice. So here's our time skip, and it's six months later. And after the Russian journey, the inner circle of the terrorists meet. Robrov announces that Natasha has been captured by the Russians. And it's related that Arnold has pronounced the war balloon a success in Russia. And Natasha has been caught in the house of a nihilist who is betrayed. However, the Brotherhood's aerial has been completed. And it's the only ship fast enough to make it to Siberia on time for a rescue. Meanwhile, there's been a secret treaty between the French and the Russians that has been discovered. And preparations are to be made to counter their military advances. Alexis Mazanov or Colston, is sent on to rendezvous with Arnold and rescue Natasha. Colston meets Arnold at Drumcraig. He relates the news, and Arnold is eager to make the rescue. The aerial can travel 100 miles per hour, and it'll take 20 hours to get there. The hull of the aerial is 70 by 20 feet, so rather spacious. The ship is compared to a naval ship. It has four engines, one driving each of the two fan wheels where a naval ship's mass would normally be, and one driving the two side propellers and one driving the stern propeller. Arnold is working on the speed all the time, so he expects that the speed will be doubled like very short. Yeah, 
And this is the first model, so some of the later models are a bit superior in what they can do. But the Jane illustrations of the ship does make it very much look like a naval yacht that is just flying around with some propellers in the air. It's, it's kind of silly looking, but also kind of cool at the same time. Yeah, and this is obviously very influenced by, by naval fiction. Oh, yeah. There's so much. There's so much. I mean, we're coming up to it, and I kind of want to just skip over most of it. <laughs> but it was actually not bad to read because it was some tension. But like, there's oh, yeah. a lot of battle scenes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah. And we won't give it the play-by-play, -play, but they're there. And I think that the naval warfare genre really starts going in the prior couple decades. On board, there are cabins for six people and a central saloon. It's pressurized and sealed for weather. The crew consists of an Englishman, a German, a Frenchman, and a Russian. The Englishman, however, refuses to speak any of the other languages, so it's a rather kind of comical jab at the English, which we don't see too, too often in this novel. Yeah, there's not a lot of humor at all. No. no. It's actually very dry and stilt like stilted. Yeah. None of the dialogue is memorable. No. <laughs> in fact, some of the dialogue is quite bad, and some of it really reminded me of that show Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. I don't know if you've ever seen that I've one. I've never seen that. It's, I've heard I can, about it highly recommend it to you and all of our listeners here it might awesome. be the best i guess horror sci-fi genre comedy i've seen where it really captures the essence of like bad low production <laughs> genre filmmaking but it does so from an obvious fan's perspective like somebody who loves the stuff and isn't just trying to make fun of it and I guess, kick at some low-hanging fruit. Yeah. So it doesn't come off like Sharknado, basically, is what you're e Exactly, saying. yeah. <laughs> but it really captures yeah. just, like, the strange expository dialogue that no person would ever say, but you could tell the author is trying to get across some, like, world-building plot point or something like that. Yeah. It, it's really worth watching. It's really, really funny. I, I definitely want to check that out. Yeah. So, some lines in the novel really reminded me of that show they feel really unnatural and stilted, and it just seems like Griffith is trying to explain somebody's backstory or what's been going on, because he does this time skip plot device quite a bit, and he just kind of throws you in a new location, and that's his way of telling you what's been going on in the last know, six months or however. And yeah. it is a little awkward. I was captured by that one passage, though, like that, that uh, scene of several paragraphs that will be on the podcast because it did really seem like, and it's about here that it happens. Yeah. And it did really seem like very modern and very much like almost like a video game. You know? Yeah. Says so flying overhead and dropping missiles on your right. targets. And right. It definitely seemed ahead of its time. Yeah. It, it, it certainly did. Yeah. And it was kind of exciting. The dialogue was still not good, but like just the whole, you can kind of picture the the airship around you and the sounds and the, the, the weird feeling that he had pushing that button. and so, Right. Yeah. <laughs> and as you said, that's coming right up. So our crew of the Englishmen, the German, the Frenchmen, and the Russian, who are all speaking English, take off very high and make their way to Europe. And Colston is totally engrossed in the gorgeous sights. They make pretty good time, and then they propose that a first strike is conducted. There were some very evocative scenes. Here's one, for instance. While he was speaking, Arnold trained the gun according to a scale on the curved steel rod, which passed through his screw socket in the breach of the piece. Now, he said, watch. He pressed a button on the top of the breach. There was a sharp but not very loud sound as the compressed air was released. Something rushed out of the muzzle of the gun. And a few seconds later, Colston could see the missile boring its way through the air and pursuing a slanting but perfectly direct path to the center of the fortress. A second later, it struck. You could see a bright greenish flash as it smoked the steel roof of the central fort. Then the fort seemed to crumble up and dissolve into fragments. And a few moments later, a dull report 
floated up into the sky, mingled as he thought with screams of human agony. For a moment he stared in silence through the glasses. Then he turned to Arnold and said in a voice that trembled with violent emotion, Good God, that is awful! The whole of the central citadel is gone, as though it had been swept off the face of the earth. I can hardly see even the ruins of it. Surely that's murder rather than war. No more murder than the use of torpedoes in naval warfare, as far as I can see, replied Arnold coolly. Remember, too, he continued in a sterner tone, that fortress belongs to the power that flogged Radna and has captured Natasha. Come, let's see what execution you can do. He crossed the deck and set the other gun by its scale, saying as he did so, Put your finger on the button. Press when I tell you. Colston did as he was bid. And as his finger touched the little knob, his hand was as firm as though he had been making a shot at billiards. Now! He pressed the button down hard. There was the same sharp sound, and a second messenger of destruction sped on its way towards the doomed fortress. They saw it strike, and then came the flash. And after that, a huge cloud of dust mingled with flying objects. It might have been blocks of masonry, guns, or human bodies. Rose into the air, and then fell back again to the earth. There goes one of the angles of the fortification into the sea, said Arnold as he saw the effects of the shot. Kronstadt won't be much good when the wall breaks out, it strikes me. I suppose they'll be replying soon with a few rifle shots. We'd better quicken up a bit. He went aft to the wheelhouse, followed by Colston, and signaled for the three propellers to work at their utmost speed. The order was instantly obeyed. The fan wheels ceased revolving, and in the impetus of her propellers, the Ariel leapt forward and upwards like an eagle on its upward swoop rose 500 feet in the air, and then swept over Kronstadt at a speed of more than a hundred miles an hour. So after this rather exciting scene of destruction and explosions, our crew passes over St. Petersburg without being noticed and arrives at Tumen in Siberia, where they land in a forest glade. They meet up with Ivan Petrovich, disguised as a fur trader, and their orders are not to be taken alive. Colston is disguised as Stepan Bakuinen. The Russian names are a little bit oddly anglicized in the text, mm. and it kind of, <laughs> I had to spend some effort on how it actually be written in Russian. But they meet up with the subcommissioner of police and say, in the master's name. And they learn about Natasha's whereabouts. That would be our master, Satan. Right. <laughs> Who else? Yes. Police officer Sudakin is ordered to leave Russia after the business is done. And he uses the Queenan's passport. He makes a reference to going to Konigsberg. Ironically, now is a weird exclave of Russia that was taken during World War II, but during this time it was the eastern border of Prussia and a very, very German city. Yeah, wasn't Hoffman from there? Yes, yes he was. Yeah. But they have a note from Natas that he is to be removed to account for his disappearance. He returns with Natasha and the princess handcuffed to some soldiers and in some pretty bad condition, and they're shuffled off to a cell somewhere. His nephew, Ernst Vronsky, and his servant, Ivan Arkavovich, and the soldiers change guard. During the guard change, they bribe the new guard with brandy, which seems to be quite poisoned. After he yeah. succumbs to the brandy... It's much worse than regular brandy. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> None of that E&J. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. 
they take his uniform and they do the whole uniform switch maneuver, which again seems so commonplace in modern secret agent sci-fi stuff. Oh yeah. And it always sounded silly. It sounds silly here, but it works. Uh, this scene is fun and it's exciting. And they use the uniform to sneak up on the other guard and shoot him in the head. But it's as usual with this guy. Like it just doesn't, the scene doesn't pop. Like it doesn't have, you don't see anything about these characters or what they're thinking or anything. Like, yeah. It's just kind of, I don't know. This was actually the hardest part. This, this whole section was really, really hard for me to read. Yeah, I kind of like this scene a lot, actually. Really? The, okay, the, I, I like the idea of it. I just, like, I don't know. I mean, that that particular part was cool. Like, I, yeah. I did like that. But just this entire section of rescuing Natasha and then this weird, like, again, imitating people that's not really yeah. gone into. Like, <laughs> right. it's not really, I don't know. It's just, this is the part that really bogged me down. Like, I went, like, three or four days without reading very much. Oh, really? Yeah, kind of, I, you know, I didn't know this is what tripped you up, yeah. I mean, the whole identity switching thing is a bit cumbersome, and there are a lot of names thrown at you at once who are, like, totally inconsequential to the story right. beyond the scene. But it's kind of a fun getaway, even though it is a little silly. It's not so much that it was silly, I just wish it was written with more attention to the people doing the right. things. Yeah. Right, yeah. It's just, yeah. everything seems very detached. Yeah, it, it does. Just seems, yeah. It seems like... Griffith just wants to be this sort of all-seeing, all-seeing eye overlooking everything, but not really making a lot of commentary on the thoughts of the people involved or what right. they're feeling right. or anything, really. No, we don't really get into the head of any of these characters at, at all, it, unless they're explicitly giving us a political monologue, which right. doesn't really make much sense most of the time, so. Yeah, if this were made into a movie, which I actually thought about many times, I yeah. thought about if this were made into a movie because it's that kind of book. Like it's like it feels like a blockbuster kind oh, of. Oh, it absolutely does. Yeah. But if this were made into a movie, they would definitely have to spend a lot of time focusing on these characters and how yeah. to make them live and breathe, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was picturing like the Bava Euro spy, you know, diabolical. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah. He, could, he could do so much fun with the costumes and the set design and all the snappy dialogue and things like that. It, it would make this really come to life a lot more than it actually yeah, does. I think this would have made a good movie, actually. Yeah, yeah, or at least parts of it. Uh, the, the whole thing, maybe not so much, but certainly well, no, certain but Like, even those air battles and stuff, you could do yeah. some awesome special effects and yeah. just make it really exciting. You would definitely have to work on the script. Like, you would have to change all the dialogue. Yeah. And, <laughs> but that's fine. Like, yeah, that's what that's script fine. writers do, right? Yeah, so, yeah for sure. Yeah. Yep. So... Our rescuers are able to locate Natasha and the princess with the guards disposed of. They are disguised as peasant boys. They use a horse and sleigh to get away, but are quickly pursued by the Cossacks. Colston and Natasha start shooting at them, and Natasha in particular has some pretty incredible accuracy. Again, leading to the video game nature of the whole thing and the yeah. summer blockbuster movie where... Our heroes right. hit their enemy with every shot, and the enemies miss our heroes with every one of theirs. And that whole scene in the er earlier on that we were talking about with yeah. the uh, you know the air thing was like it was very much like somebody shooting missiles from the air onto their targets and sure. blasting them away and yeah. pressing the button. You know, yeah, right, it's, it's right. all about that. <laughs> and it's really funny because there's a comment in the book, and I thought I thought this was really interesting, and and I don't know like. We're kind of discussing a lot of it as we're summarizing it, but that kind of makes sense because it's such a long book. I don't want to be like, yeah. by the time we're done with the summary, we're going to be too exhausted to talk about it. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, like, so there's this one part where they're commenting on warfare and how warfare, how the nature of warfare has changed, right? And obviously this is supposed to take place in 1904. The war that's coming is, yeah, is right, 1904. Right. And this is 10 years before World War I happens. In reality, one of the major problems with World War One was that it was too much like the past wars. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's complicated when I say that, but like the fact that it wasn't just people pushing a button, it was superiors telling other people who are the citizens of their country that they should massacre themselves. Yeah. For the right. sake of that country. Gigantic armies marching at one another, except instead of holding swords and spears, they're holding high-capacity machine guns. Yeah. And so what I find interesting is that Griffith is saying, well, the problem with warfare now is that it's not like that. Now it's... And he's saying the same thing that Wells is saying, but 
he's doing it in a way more obtuse kind of less intelligent way. Yeah. Almost like, yeah. you know, he's, he's kind of being like, well, yeah, this new science is going to be a big problem to warfare. But he's also saying like, oh, I, I don't know. I don't know what he's saying, actually, because on the one hand, it's almost like he's saying, well, that's too bad. But on the other hand, he's like, but this could actually end a war, and I approve of that. So it's just sort of another indication of how the message in this book really doesn't come across. And I no, feel like they're, yeah. I feel like it, it kind of wants to be a message. Like, War in the Air was a very clear message. Absolutely, yeah. This book is a very un un unclear message. Yeah, it's all over the place. And I don't think Griffith knew what he was trying to say with this himself. No. Yeah, so our heroes are getting away. They're shooting the enemy with pretty good results. And from the air, an artillery shell comes down and hits the Cossacks. And there's another huge explosion. And Colson and Natasha are able to get away. And the death mark of the bloody T is on the forehead of the officer whose clothes they took and switched uniforms from. The Burning Cross. Yeah. <laughs> A telegram reports pretty much worldwide on the destruction of the Kronstadt Fortress, and it sparks a debate on that air navigation is now possible. But it matters who holds the power, though, because if it's these nihilist society might fall apart. Russia now has 50 war balloons and arranges with France to attack the major powers once balloons have been tested. There's some minor skirmishes between the Russians and the Indians in Hindu Kush, and that's observed by an airship, which is the aerial pushing on towards Africa. And here is where it starts to lose me. So here we again get a time skip and a jump and scene, and we are related the adventures of Lewis Holt and Thomas Jackson, yeah. who, inspired by Jules Verne, decide to cross Africa by balloon. They're not heard from until a collapsed balloon is found in the Gulf of Guinea containing a manuscript, which is eventually published in some transactions somewhere, and read by Arnold. And Arnold had resolved to rescue these two if he had ever built an airship, even though for some reason it's just coming up in the story now. So we get a bit into this Lost World stuff in a bit, and it's this is where it really loses focus for me. Because before, the secret agent stuff of them doing the rescue, I mean, yeah, he could have written it a little better, but at least kind of ties in more with the themes that he was going for in the beginning. Whereas this, it just seems like he's throwing darts at a wall. And yeah. seeing what sticks. I, I mean, I like the idea of this, and it actually it actually made me think about how differently this book could have been written. Yeah. And by the end, I kind of gave up on that because it was just getting too much. But like <laughs> the whole idea of, well, you got a serialized novel. Why don't you like, why don't you write these three different stories? Like, why don't you write the story of the Brotherhood and Arnold, the story of Alan Muir, and the story of Lewis, and then, after you write those, you write a fourth part that somehow ties them all together. Yeah, right. And shows that it was all the goal of this Natas character right. to get everything together and organized. Like, that would have been kind of cool. I don't know. I'm not yeah. really a professional editor, but if I would sat down with George, I would have been like, hey, man, why don't you do this? We have this serial format. Like, why don't we use it to our advantage? Right. Kind of? Yeah. I don't know. But, no, it doesn't really come together in a satisfying way, I don't think. But here we learn that Natasha's father is Jewish, and she is held at his behest for marriage. And there's lots of talk about Arnold winning her, and wonders if she knows that he loves her. In the air, Arnold and Natasha are together, and he says he will win the world for her, and they do some pretty silly flirting. She says flirting. she's too consumed with hatred to love right yeah. now. <laughs> so if he can conquer her hatred, then he can have her. Right. So, so again, more her being a trophy to be won. Yeah, yeah. She says that she will give herself to him when there is peace on Earth, and that she says he has no rival. And it's, again, real callback to chivalry-type stuff from Walter Scott romances, or even earlier from Mallory or stuff like that. But he pretty much has an insurmountable-seeming obstacle there. It's like, well, you can, you can love me if we have world peace. 
Yeah, well, we'll <laughs> it see what sounds like something out of a fairy tale, right? Right, right. exactly. You know, like maybe Arthurian, yeah, like Ma- Mallory or something yeah. like that. And, and I think uh, Griffith did like reading that kind of stuff and probably wanted yeah, to, yeah. to put his spin on that. But the princess and Colston are satisfied at their wooing, and meanwhile, they're flying above Africa at a height of 3,000 feet, descending in an uninhabited valley. And they're looking to find area where we get this line of dialogue from, I think Natasha says, you know, I and the princess are dying to see this mysterious unknown country that only two other people have ever seen. And that's the one line that like Dark Place really stuck out at me as this really (laughs) awkward, like expository type. Because we're just thrown into this Africa setting and I had to look up to see if like Lewis and Holt were real explorers and if he was referencing some contemporary event because it just does come out of nowhere. But no, they aren't real. It's all for the novel, and Griffith is just plotting it in this really clunky fashion. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the place of area becomes significant. Yeah. And it's in the next book as well, actually. Yeah, right, apparently, but yeah. the whole explorer's thing is, and the Lost World thing is pretty much just abandoned. Yeah. Like, it's, oh, so that's where we're going now? Oh, uh, yeah. no, no? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So they stretch a little bit and take off again and are able to locate area and touch down nearby. And Arnold's flirting more with Natasha and even offers to let her steer the ship, so good for her. In reality, everybody has to take cover as he is going to perform a leap maneuver to get over the mountains. I guess they're too high to get over any other way or something. It's dangerous, but of course successful. And there's a nice illustration of the aerial at this point in the text. They come across a Paradise Valley that is lost in the mountains. So it's very reminiscent of She by Haggard from 1887, only a couple years earlier. That was a massive, massive success. And we will be covering on the podcast at some point later Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I have a yeah. feeling it's better written than this book. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, apparently it's quite good and quite exciting and, and holds up. But also very influential. So this was clearly read by Griffith as well. They don't see any inhabitants, but they do see a Union Jack. And eventually, Holt and Jackson come out. Arnold is instructed to make a thorough exploration of area. And Holt and Jackson have conveniently already extensively surveyed the region. There is apparently a lost race of ape-like men, which again is totally dropped in the novel. They spend a month there and then leave Holt and Jackson behind to do whatever. Yeah, he's never heard from again. Neither is Holt, in fact. Yeah, right. (laughs) So they rendezvous with a steamer. Steamer's a little late, but they meet up, and Roborov, Radna, and other Inner Circle members are on board. Arnold receives a letter of congratulations from Natas, also a letter from Tremaine, or Lord Alanmere, giving him an account of affairs in Europe. All right, and we will be getting to him in a moment. Yes. Until now, we have just completed 19 chapters, and we have been hearing a lot about Natas. We've never actually met Natas in the text. No, he's just like this mysterious figure that up to this point has been kind of alluded to and mentioned in the background. Right. And he sent letters. And he has met Arnold. Arnold has, and this is one of the things that irritates me, about the whole time jump thing is <laughs> right. that we don't get to see that first yeah, meeting of Arnold yeah, and Natas. Right. So here in chapter 19, we finally meet Natas. Natas is a very interesting creation, but also not quite interesting enough. But he's very interesting yeah. in what he implies. 
Nathas is described as this deformed kind of person. He is in a wheelchair. His face is half bestial looking. He's a dwarf. Now, what I thought was really interesting, though, is this is written in 1893. It's kind of right at the heart of this thing that you would see for a long time in literature and maybe especially movies of a certain vintage where you get a person who is very obviously disabled and like deformed looking. You may as well say it. They look like a freak. And that is almost like depicted as a reason for their corruption. Yeah, right. This isn't the case at all here. No, it's um, not. I thought this was really interesting. He describes yeah. it once. He describes what Natas looks like. And he never does it again. He never even alludes to it. There is one time when he says that because the steamer that they're on, is it gets blown up, they have to pick up Natas and carry him. Yeah. But that is literally the pretty much the only time that his disability is ever mentioned in the story. Yeah. I mean, we get so, a huge data dump on his backstory right. in literally the very last chapter. And it's like, come on, Griffith, learn how to plot your fucking novels here. I know. But <laughs> even, even there, though, that aspect is not that gone into. Yeah. Like, I, I thought... I'm not going to say it was an enlightened portrayal of, of disability in any way, but it, it it was less, like, strident than normal. It was less like, right. oh, look at that freak, you know, like, that you get from a lot of... And I'm not... I read a lot of stuff from that time period. I'm not put out by that, even as a disabled person myself. But, like, it just... In this book, it, it does seem a little bit less central than you would think that it might be. Right. And in the end, it, it, his disabled his disability is kind of part of the source of his wrath, but it's not really even the most significant one. There is another problem, though, with Natas. Natas is a mesmerist, and this is a huge, huge, glaring issue I found with this book. Yeah, that really pissed me off, actually. <laughs> Natas is a mesmerist. This Tremaine, whom he's meeting with at this point in the book is his agent in England, in Britain. Tremaine is a politician. His job is to make speeches for the Brotherhood. But he doesn't know this. He does not, in fact, even realize that he's an agent of the Brotherhood. So he is being controlled by Natas and is apparently unaware of it. And this is like the weird thing that was alluded to earlier about a mystery about Alan Mir slash yeah. Tremaine right. is that he seems to live this double life and even people that see him that are from the Brotherhood and they make some like the covert sign that other people in the Brotherhood are supposed to recognize Tremaine doesn't and that is a really interesting concept which yeah. Griffith completely and utterly fails yeah. to address in any fashion in fact he totally skips it over, yeah. Yeah, not only that, so so we go into, we're talking a lot at this point about the international situation in the world and how much it's deteriorating and how there is this triple alliance, which is kind of a real thing. It's, it's not quite the way Griffith imagined it. Uh, no. By nine, but, but it's like there is the Russians and the French and the Italians, and there were, they're sort of on one side, and then there's the British, the Germans... The Slovenians are in there, which I guess is to be, like, part of the remnant of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Yeah. The Italian situation, I, it took me a while to figure out what he was trying to say with this. Because when he talks about the Triple Alliance, he doesn't really spell out who the powers are initially. But the Italians are potentially align but then they're spurned by this like loan yeah. that doesn't go through so they so decide to the go thing. with the russians and right. the french they were going to lend italy a whole bunch of money yeah and tremaine's job as a part of the brotherhood but an unknowing part of the brotherhood a servant of natas his job is to make sure that this loan doesn't go through so his job is to piss off italy enough that it will definitely be on the other side so the Brotherhood here is, they're the cause of war. 
their feeling is that this would happen anyway or something like it. We just want to be in control of the circumstances when they do happen so that we can rise and take possession of the entire world on the behalf of the unions, the socialists, and the Anglo-Saxon race. Yeah, right. Yep. So this is where it gets even wackier with the politics because this really when they're talking wacky. about like a world socialist revolution and okay, he's conflating it with the nihilist and anarchist. That just means he's not very well read. Okay, fine. So are lots of other people. You know, I, I can live with that. But then he gets into the Anglo-Saxon stuff and it's like, wait, he's not just describing the British Empire, which like already exists at this point in time? Like, what yeah. the hell is he trying to say? It doesn't make any sense. And, and it's almost like, I feel sorry for Griffith. I think that, that he had potential to, maybe if he had kept writing after that 10 years, you know, maybe if his health hadn't been so bad, he would have broken away from this. And for all I know, maybe at the end of his career, he did. But considering that Angel of the Revolution is seemingly his most well-regarded work, I have a feeling that's not the case. Yeah, McLean says it's by far his best novel, so, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really make me interested in reading some of his other adventures, especially the sequel. Honeymoon in Space sounds wacky enough, and it's like half the length of it, where it yeah, might it be worth giving bad, a shot, but, uh, but who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Ogre Romanov sounds even wackier than this. Yeah. But... I think I think my main problem with Griffith is that he's just not a very good writer. Yeah, right. Like it doesn't like if you describe his books to somebody, they sound cooler than they actually are, and you you know you have to yeah. keep pointing out, well, right. he doesn't really go into this or he doesn't right, really right, do right. this. So so here's the thing, right? He's talking about this Anglo-Saxon primacy over the world, and my feeling is all he really did was take a look at who his audience might be. Yep. I was like, huh, you guys, right? You want to be masters of the world? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, wouldn't that make my audience feel great? Yeah. I think there's nothing more to it than that. And that's both the silliest thing ever, and I guess it lets him off the hook a little bit, because maybe, sure. you know, yeah. maybe he doesn't really believe half the shit that he's saying. Right, and it really blunts the subversive angle of making your heroes the terrorist, the nihilist, the anarchist, the socialist. Yeah. Just saying that they're all doing it for the glory of of the Anglo-Saxons. And this is something that he doesn't gloss over. This comes up a lot from this mm. point forward. It really kind of normalizes it and grounds it back to reality and what the British public probably would have been feeling at the time. Because he does go into yellow peril stuff at this point in the novel, saying that there's a sect yeah, of Buddhists in the, the East. Yeah, he about the Buddhists. And yeah. <laughs> the Buddhists will, will rise up against everyone because yeah. they'll see that Europe is fallen in flames and it's right. now time. Yeah. Mind you, I would like to point out again that even though this seems really wacky, this was a common sentiment of the time. And Absolutely. even like 25 years later, during Sox Rumor's writing of the Fu Manchu novels, this was really a thing. Yep. So, and yep. that is actually a, in the first Fu Manchu book. I can't remember if it's the Hand of Fu Manchu or what it's called. I read it like almost 20 years ago now. But there is a big long speech about Buddhism and how it's the antithesis of European culture and how it will destroy right. Europe. And this, like, in retrospect, like, it just seems so bizarre, especially because 50 years after that the Western conception of Buddhism shifted so far the other way yeah, exactly. that it was right. also kind of ridiculous, but yeah. it was like kind of, I love peace. I love Buddhism. Like that doesn't, right. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. It's, it's, it's an interesting depiction of how things really change over time. But at the same time, like the naivety isn't necessarily lost. Yeah. So, I mean, we can say that George Griffith was very naive and definitely seems to be the case in a lot of areas, but I don't think that people 100 years on, as a rule, that much more enlightened necessarily or anything. No, probably so not. You just got to take everything, I guess. I mean, that that's in the end, at the end of the day, this book doesn't really stand out for its writing. It stands out for its wacky ideas and the cool air battle scenes. Yeah. And also how early it is comparatively to some other works. Right. I would just like to point out once again that Tremaine is being mind controlled and not us has come to him, this time mano a mano, so we think, to tell him that he's been mind-controlled this entire time and to reveal the entire truth to him like a James Bond villain would do. 
So what do you think our esteemed Lord of Almir does at this point? Does he raise his sword for Britain and attempt to cut down this filthy cur? No, not at all. In fact, he agrees to go along with it. Yeah, He says, oh, it's conflict. all fine now that you've explained everything to me. I actually agree with you 100%. So, <laughs> I, I'm i sorry, but this is like the funniest, weirdest, weirdest scene I have yeah. ever, like I have read in a very long time. Again, like, very just, Garth Marenghi dark place. Yeah, and I just like the fact that 99.9% .9 of us, if we were told we were being mind controlled by a terrorist mastermind, would be horrified. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> But this yeah. esteemed British politician just goes, oh, well, all right then. I suppose totally you've shown me. Yeah. So just to prove himself, I guess, and that it's not over, Natas mesmerizes him again. Well, I mean, we assume that he's been doing that before. We don't actually see it, but he mesmerizes him. Alan Mir Tremaine has a vision of Armageddon, and he's deeply affected by this. And he goes to bed and he dreams of his would-be wife. Now, there was a hint earlier that he was interested in Natasha, but this is totally not true. I guess it's just because, have we mentioned this? Yes, Natasha is Natas's daughter. Yeah. And so I guess Natas seems to show undue interest in Natasha because he is her father. Right. And so when he is mind controlling Tremaine, Tremaine seems to show undue interest in Natasha. I don't know. I'm overthinking it. <laughs> I'm really overthinking it because Griffith doesn't go into it at all. No, he doesn't. No, he and doesn't. this is the most frustrating thing about the book to me is that the things that I thought were really interesting about the ideas in this book are the things that he doesn't explore. Right. right. And so, like, all the time I'm reading it, I'm like, what? can't we get to those things? That Yeah. I don't know. And it's I mean, just... there there's like seven or eight different cool novels sandwiched and shoved into this one. Like, he yeah. could have made a really cool novel about the beginning Russian espionage plot. Right. You know what I mean? And that could have been a self-contained story. And he, if he wanted to create like a shared universe, he could have tied it into the Lost World novel. Yeah, and... right. All right. So I think the message to George, who's uh, 100 years dead now, <laughs> is, George, don't write so fast. Right. Slow down a bit. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I guess you got to make money, though, making your cereals, right? Especially if it's a weekly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a really creative person, and a creative person who's being perhaps stymied by the format that he has to write in to make the money that he needs to survive. Yeah. But then again, Wells was published in the same periodical, so. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Well, in the morning, they make plans to rendezvous with some Americans led by Michael, the brother of the, the president of the Brotherhood. So the steamer on which Natas Tremaine and this crew has been heading, they're going to Queenstown in New York, but they encounter a French cruiser and torpedo boat. And this is the first of many, many naval engagements slash naval air engagements that are all over this book. Yeah, and I can't say I'm too familiar with any naval combat fiction, but I can imagine Griffith definitely was at this point, because I can imagine that he pulled this scene and a lot of other scenes in this book from other popular naval warfare novels at the time. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I can't really think of antecedents either, but at the same time, I feel like there was a lot afterwards even if I couldn't name necessarily, it'd be like by reputation, like Alistair MacLean, for instance, and yeah. other like really popular naval writers. Yeah. I know there are a lot of them. And I yeah. know that I, I read some of them when I was like early teen or something because I was kind of interested in, in like the World War II right. naval stuff and all that. And I just, right, right. many of the names escape me right now, but I just feel yeah. like 50 years on, this kind of stuff would still be really popular, and I'm sure there were examples before Griffith. No, for sure, yeah. There definitely were. I haven't oh, read Jules any of them, but when we were doing the Simsonia bit, I was like, ah. my 1820s a little early for naval stuff. I wonder what other naval stuff there was, and yeah. it turns out 1820 is pretty early for it, but it does get going a couple decades later. Okay, yeah. So there's a naval battle, and the terrorist steamer and the French torpedo boat are sunk. So this is where they have to carry Natas and 
the Ethereal, the new airship, shows up in the nick of time to save yeah. Natas and company. And there's a parley with a British ship. Arnold announces them as the terrorists and act as though they have supremacy over the war, which really, really pisses off the Brit. But the Ethereal just sort of shoots away into the sky before any aggression can happen. So that's good. I don't know. It's kind of funny. Like, they call themselves the terrorists all the time and they rejoice in that term. Yeah. It's not used as an insult at all. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of the things that, that kind of makes the book amusing, I guess, because yeah. terrorism sort of attains such a different connotation in the 20th oh, absolutely. and 21st century. Yeah. And it's kind of cool. I mean, it's not the same, but I mean, it reminds me kind of of Blake 7 and how like it's it's essentially sure, the right. terrorists who are, I mean, yeah. but they never call themselves that. That's the yeah. thing. They yeah. don't believe that that's what they are. And I think that's what, I don't know. It's an interesting question that is way beyond what this novel is willing to address. <laughs> right. So, I mean... That would be the kind of thing that would be gone into if this were a different kind of novel, but it's not. So the Arania, which is this huge American ship loaded with passengers and, and goods and stuff, and it's the fastest ship known to the sea. I can't remember how fast it goes, and I didn't write it down, but it's yeah, much slower either. than the airships, but it's still yeah. pretty fast for a, a steamer yacht, I guess, ship. Yeah. So, but the Italians are nearby, and they want to sink it before it gets to Britain. So, a spy on board sets off a flare, and now we go to Michael Roboroff, who is the Roboroff, who is the American representative of the Brotherhood, and he shoots the spy in the arm, but not before the flare is released. So, they're soon surrounded by enemies, and even while they're making their way back to the previous escort, so like they kind of try and double back because what they have is this series of kind of pylons, where different ships will be waiting for them and they right. can sort of escort them on their journey. And it's it's a neat system that, that Griffith seems to like describing this stuff. Yeah, I mean, they have to maintain 3,000 miles of ocean and it's Britain doing the escorting. So it's yeah. a pretty elaborate system that they have going on. Right. But they, they realize that they're getting like, they're going to run into trouble. So they start trying to double back on their course. And there's this big battle and an airship intercedes, and it makes short work of the Franco-Italians. And we get more international detail here. It's kind of like exposition, sort of like what we see in the wells, but mm, I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, it's, it's not a bad way of handling it, I guess. So the Anglo-Teutonic Alliance... And the franco slavonian League are the two opposing forces. No, the Slavonians, forces. not the Slovenians. Yeah, Slavonians, right. And there's various respective smaller allies, but the great skirmishes erupt in the six weeks since hostilities are declared, which is around the time, I guess, just after Alan Mir made his speech. Yeah. And the Germans and Austrians suffer very heavy casualties, and there's this like sort of propagandistic... British newspaper article that uh, Griffith shows us and it describes the empire's determination to stand strong with all party divisions eliminated, you know, your typical political shenanigans. And the war balloons are a huge problem for the Anglo-Slavonian, no, not Slavonian, uh, sorry, I'm getting everything mixed up. Anglo-Teutonic. Yeah, Anglo-Teutonic alliance. And the war balloons are essentially, they're similar, I guess, to some of the ones that Wells describes. And they also have some yeah. similar limitations in that they, they're good for bombarding targets from the air, but they can't really fight each other very well. Right. And they also are very limited in their navigation where they can rise and fall easily, but moving like side to side or back and forth, it's not as easy as the terrorist aerial. Right. And they can go higher than Arnold's airships, but right. they, they certainly don't travel as fast. No. Arnold has managed to reach 150 miles an hour now, so he's getting really good at this. But still, the war balloons are able to drop large amounts of ordnance on armies and artillery and things like that below without them being able to fire back. Just That's because true. they're able to get so high. So they're able yeah. to totally decimate ground and naval forces. Pretty much unchecked. Now here... 
I thought this was kind of interesting. I mean, you know, we are we are sort of looking at these things from a historical perspective. Yeah. So the book actually mentions several real politicians at this point that really did exist. Mm. I didn't note all of them down, but I recognized a few of the other names. And of course, there's Prime Minister Balfour, and I assumed that it would be the same guy. Yeah. Who? Yeah. So he's already been mentioned a few times in the podcast, and he was Prime Minister for a while, so... And we also learned that Queen Victoria has decided to gracefully abdicate the throne because I guess war is too much for her ladyship. Yeah. We didn't really talk about this in the beginning. Maybe we can more towards the end. But I really wondered what some of the critics thought of the decisions that <laughs> Griffith made here. Yeah, I mean, Edward is on the throne and he ascended to the throne I guess not too, too long after this was published. I mean, Victoria was old at this point in her reign, but still, it seems like yeah, it'd be a controversial that, thing to say. Right. And it's just like, it kind of seems to be like, well, this this man can handle this, this situation better than she can, right? Yeah. I, guess. I don't know. I mean, by 1893, she wasn't that old. Like, by 1903? Okay. I guess. But... Yeah. Uh, 1893, she was born in 1819, so... Yeah. Um, she would have yeah. been pushing... Pushing yeah. So now it seems due to further reports, and there were allusions to this earlier, when the Americans got word of a ship flying across the Mediterranean. And that seems weird. And right away, Michael Ruboroff is suspicious. And it seems the Russians have an airship. How'd that happen? Yep. Well, the Russians achieve a massive victory over the British and German and Danish ships. And many are lost. And I think this happens over Copenhagen. And the airship is very clearly one of Arnold's airships. So the president of the Brotherhood, Nicholas, is summoned. And he's been hanging out on area, which at this point, I guess, Arnold and company hasn't had time to visit for a while. And there was a storm. And he had four Russian men sheltering in one of the airships. And there are 12 airships now, all told. And the Russians, who are all technicians from the outer circle, they make off with the ship. And it's believed that their intention is to bring it to the Tsar. Yeah. This part is another part that's just like really weirdly plotted in how he structures the events. It yeah. just doesn't follow logically. I mean, it, it, when you summarize it, it sounds, it sounds like, like it, it does. Yeah, yeah but I, it, it just doesn't the way he writes it. He jumps back and forth a lot in ways that aren't, like, right. feel natural. And you would think that if this happened, like, Roborov would have, like, he would have told them right away. Yeah. Because it's not portrayed that he's a traitor. They yeah. treat him like he's a traitor because they don't know. But it's not portrayed that he is a traitor. And by the way, like, we know nothing about this character. Like, it's not like he's a character in the book or anything. But I'm just saying, like, he doesn't really seem to have done anything wrong except not explaining what the fuck happened. Yeah. Like, why did he have to wait to be called up? Like, hey, one of our airships is way over here. Yeah, like, right. Doing damage for the yeah. Franconi. Like, what's going on? And yeah. he's like, oh, yeah, uh, I forgot to tell you. Yeah. Four Russians escaped <laughs> yeah. with an airship. Yeah, so they escape, and Natas, there's a ceremony of sorts, and Natas takes away Nicholas's position as president. But this won't matter. Because, you know, he, he's not upset about it. He doesn't go out for revenge or anything. It's just something that happens. So Colston uh, or Alexis and Branda are married. And three airships go chasing after the Russians at this point. And the three ships go to Petersburg where the arsenal is. And Natas, he thinks that the Radigade ships and the they're the cylinders, they have these gas cylinders that power them, and they're apparently really powerful and very dangerous. And they are the two combined elements or gases that Arnold has, has concocted to be the fuel for his airships, but also kind of more than that. Like, it's, it's almost like, I don't know. I mean, later on, I mean, this is just me speculating, but... Like in Oka Romanov, which I haven't read, and I don't know if I yeah. will. I mean, yeah, I don't think we're going to cover that one for the podcast. Yeah, I honest. mean, it sounds delightfully wacky, but it's also Griffith, so it means it's probably not that well written. Right, it's also um, long, but uh, in comparable length to this, like it's a little shorter, but I don't know. This right. one hundred fifty thousand words drags in a different way that like a seventy-five thousand word mediocre novel. It would, does, you know? yeah, yeah. 
But the Aryans in the second book have basically evolved into the Vrilia from the coming race. Yeah. <laughs> so it just kind of makes me think maybe this, this the two gases are kind of like, it's almost like Vril. Like it just seems really powerful and it can do all sorts of things. And so this professor, Vornov in Russia, has got a, a hold of the ship now and the cylinders. And Nathas knows this, so they fly the airship over the arsenal and they tell the professor to come out and they take him prisoner. And his assistant, I guess, chooses that specific moment to open one of the cylinders, which the professor said not to do, and it blows up the entire building. So there's an indication that the Brotherhood might have done that anyway, but now they don't have to be morally culpable because somebody else went ahead and did it. So... That's good, right? Yeah. Or terrorists, or it's that, again, I can returning to that thing in my experience, but Blake 7, where, like, these people, they have to be the ones responsible for starting this. They have to start the ball rolling, and it's all this, always this question, like, are they really guilty, right? Like, they blow things up. Mm -hmm. So the terrorists do this, too, but in this specific moment, it's sort of taken out of their hands, which I, I don't know, I found that weird. Like, we never knew anything about the assistant or... <laughs> why he should choose it's that moment certainly to open very convenient cylinder. yeah 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 it's dumb like he doesn't i don't know it's, it means nothing so the terrorists capture a flotilla of nine russian air balloons or aerostats as they're called along with their commander who's a colonel of some kind and the terrorists they decide to make an ultimatum to the czar and they tell him to surrender the airship which he has captured, which is named Lucifer, by the way. So, I mean, we do get, at least get a Lucifer name check. Yeah, this one does make a little more sense because it is the angel that betrayed the rest. Uh, yeah, so I guess so. Superficial I mean, we like never this, hear anything but... about the four Russian guys or what they want. But, yeah, I mean, I guess they want money. I don't know. Yeah, favor with the czar, I guess, maybe. I yeah, know. yeah, I guess so. So they have two prisoners of war. And I thought this scene was really cool. But again, you know, it was kind of like... None of his stuff has really gone into, but it was kind yeah. of adding to the weirdness. Yeah. The colonel gets all uppity and really pissed off, and he tries to kill Natas, and Natasha shoots him dead. And then Professor Volnov, who, like, may be rebellious, seems a bit more calm than the soldier, but he may be rebellious. But Natas just sort of looks at him and subjugates him with his will and makes the professor write a letter that accounts for the colonel's death and prove that he was not murdered out of hand. He seems to, at this point, Natas seems to want to, like, make good with the czar, sort of, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why, because he doesn't later, but... <laughs> they go to Copenhagen, where there's indeed been a whole lot of destruction, and... Yeah, right. The air battle scene that precedes the capture and the drama with Natasha, I think that is the one scene that is bears a lot of similarity to the Vern Clipper of the Clouds air battle okay. stuff. So there's a ton of air battle scenes, yeah. and to be honest, I liked them, but I didn't write anything down, because it was yeah. just like, oh, whatever, you know, I mean, it's yeah. just, yeah, like, they're, they go on for pages. Yeah, the, um, the way the balloons move and the aerials twist back and forth and things like that, apparently that all comes from Clipper of the Clouds. Huh. Wow. Okay, well, that makes me kind of think less, a little bit less, I guess, just because, like, or at least heavily inspired by Clipper of the Clouds. I don't know if it was like plagiarism to the level that some of the novels that plagiarized 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea mm. were guilty guess, of. But Yeah, I mean, there's no way to know like, without reading it. But yeah, I did think that Griffith did a pretty good job of these scenes, even yeah. though they're not really worth talking about that much. But like, he did a good job of this, and it definitely made me think of fiction to come right Where, oh absolutely yeah like yeah uh, a lot of people love military sci-fi like yep. it, that is a whole other subgenre of science fiction where it's mostly focused on soldiers and battle and and stuff like that and in theory i mean i i think it is kind of interesting but i would definitely get a little tired of reading about it all the time and i think yeah, that right it's in between the either. air battle and war in the air and this book i do have a little <laughs> bit of burnout at this point but I did enjoy these scenes. I, I thought they were well done, but they're easy to kind of skip over in that, the sense that there are things, very specific things that they accomplish, right. which we can get into. But 
So the British at this point have offered to buy the services of the Brotherhood in their airship. So this is, <laughs> I guess, Griffith seems to believe that politicians uh, are very corrupt, right? And so, you know, I mean, it makes sense, I guess. He's like, hey, we'll buy this off you. And the British are so confident that they'll say yes because they think that they're just a bunch of pirates. And the Brotherhood has to be like, no, we're not actually interested in any money. We don't want any of that. Which is an interesting thing because from the start, it seems like the Brotherhood has money. Like, they're Yeah, not... I mean, it's all lords and people of high social positions. I mean, if Natas can mesmerize Lord Alanmere to do whatever, I'm sure he could get some bank account. Yeah, I mean, it is it is weird. And Natas himself, like when we find out who he is, like he seems to be a man of means, but it doesn't account for all the means that the Brotherhood has, for sure. Yeah. And in fact, he did not invent the Brotherhood. He no, he didn't. joined the Brotherhood, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah. They do get a letter from the Tsar, and the, the letter is supposed to tell the commander of the airships that they have to give up the ship. And <laughs> unfortunately, though, the Brotherhood airship itself has to deliver that letter, which definitely makes it seem compromised. Yeah, I wouldn't want to listen to that either if I right. was the enemy. So. Yeah. They meet the fleet, and the Russian admiral, of course, is defiant, and he thinks the letter is forged, so he opens fire on the aerial. And the professor is instantly killed, and the ship almost gets destroyed. He gets disabled and nearly falls into the sea. And it's one of the few tense moments involving our main characters in the yeah. book. Yeah, otherwise they face almost no danger in the rest of the no. book. And it's all detached. It's all described from a distance in, in uh, the other situations. Like, hundreds of thousands of people die. Yeah. But our main characters are mostly untouched. Yep. So here, it feels like there might be some risk. But they just get started again. And now the Russian fleet is headed for Aberdeen in Scotland. And that is their gateway from the North Sea into Britain. There's airships in pursuit. They're about to take the Lucifer... So three airships surround the Renegade ship and they use this grapple to take hold of it. Yeah, that was a pretty cool move. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome actually. But Scotland is being totally bashed while this is happening and the Brotherhood just leaves. Like they're not they're saying they don't want to get involved in the conflicts now. They just came for their property and so they make off with their property and leave the international powers to fight. And there's an account of the siege of Aberdeen. And the town really wants to surrender, but the, the captain of the fleet doesn't. So it's kind of hilarious. It's almost like a complete reversal of what happens in New York in the war in the right. air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, they do surrender. And Russians take over the town and they seize all the coal and ammunition dumps and the North Sea Squadron of the British fleet doesn't arrive to help because they're way off somewhere on this wild goose chase that has nothing to do with anything. So it's really shitty for England. And Europe is completely falling into chaos. And communication is this huge problem. The Kaiser and Germany surrenders. And Russia is overwhelming everything. And while Europe descends into chaos, most of the Brotherhood's just hanging out in area. Yeah. And they're chilling and doing fun stuff like hunting and building things. And Arnold is testing all these war weapons. And he spends a lot of time with Natasha. He has this resolve toward mere friendliness, but it's often being tested painfully and maybe even teasingly. And poor guy is really struggling. Well, unfortunately, one day, Master of Satan summons Natasha and says she must go to America to wed Michael Roboroff, the head of the American side of the Brotherhood, because those guys are really important, and Michael has asked for her hand in marriage. Wow, this is really, this is really a blow to... Yeah. He's totally distraught, and it comes out of nowhere. It comes out of nowhere, and, and, and it's like this moment of real pathos that doesn't really, like... Again, it doesn't... I don't know. It it doesn't lead to anything good. Like, it's just not... I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's sad. We'll get to it. But Natasha is 
she's come to him and for the first time ever they kiss passionately and a lot of kissing and while they're kissing arnold who's you know obviously his manhood is very hard at this point and he just thinks about <laughs> slaying a conquest and that's, that's his, his thought while they're passionately kissing and she says she loves him and no other even if she has to obey the master's will but they go to america to meet the american section chief and his staff and here we learn a few other things about the brotherhood we learn that the brotherhood in north america consists of five million people it's quite a lot in canada too it's a lot especially for back then so and more so in europe as well and they're in the armies of both the alliance and the league yeah i think they have 12 million people in total between all the continents right and at the slightest sign those men will either throw down their arms or take them up in the name of a brotherhood so really Neither the Tsar, nor the King of Britain, nor the Kaiser. They really are meaningless in the overall scheme of things because the Brotherhood has the ultimate power already. They can force entire armies to turn against their officers. Well, anyway, we are now in... Where are we? We're in America somewhere. In the Alleghenies. Okay. Where is that? Like New York somewhere? It's a mountain chain. Right. That is in like Virginia, West Virginia. Oh, it's yeah. Where it the is American mentioned. headquarters is. Okay. Yeah. West Virginia. Okay. So they're in the mountains in Virginia. And, well, Arnold hasn't been feeling very good. We don't have a lot of identifications with the feelings of the characters. But, I mean, at this point, Griffith decides to focus his fine lens. And, you know, we get some of... Arnold's bitter feeling about this and and in, indeed it doesn't seem very fair because Arnold has contributed a lot to the cause right so why why would Natas choose this other person and why can't Natasha choose for herself I don't know well when they're before Michael Ruberoff and his gathering Natasha suddenly announces that she's been insulted and that Michael is a traitor and executes him on the spot yeah just shoots him in the head yep so, I mean, you know, when you talk about Natasha being badass, it's sort of true, but it turns out that she got, she had gotten a letter from Natas when they were on the ship, and, like, Arnold was kind of complaining about how cheerful she sounded and stuff, and he didn't seem to pick up that she sounded pretty sarcastic when she was talking yeah. about her wedding night. He, I guess he was just too bothered that he didn't notice at all. So, because Natasha got this letter... She could be relieved in the knowledge that she didn't really have to marry this Michael Roborov, who has had nothing to do with the story, except when he randomly showed up to shoot a spy. Yeah. She does get in a couple good lines before she shoots him in the head, so that's also good for her. Yeah. I mean, I did like this part. I, yeah. I This was one of the more exciting parts of the book, for sure. Yeah. At first, and... I didn't know where he was going with the whole love triangle thing, and it's like, oh, okay. He resolves yeah. it in like a chapter here. Right, right. Here they go to the Americans, and we learn about the American government and how corrupt it is, and it's been in the hands of arch-capitalists and monopolists, and these latter have made a deal with the Tsar to declare war on and starve Britain. So the rest of Europe is already conquered. It's just the Anglo-Saxon race. All it takes is one word, and American industry suddenly and decisively ceases. This is probably the most consistent anti-capitalist stuff, or at least the most consistent political messaging he's giving us is the anti-capitalist stuff, which really is focused on the most here. I guess so, yeah. I mean, I mean, it would seem that that is a sort of a goal of socialism, I guess, that is not really gone into that much more, like more rather than just like the, the corruption of politicians in general. Yeah. Like, it seems more general than that. Like, business interests, I guess they figure a little bit into the book, but not that much. So, I don't know. But airships appear, and they take over the arsenals, and Tremaine comes down the ramp, and he declares the dawn of the Anglo-Saxon Federation, and the president's arrested, and in the name of Satan, the Constitution is declared null and void. So... 
the president and other members of government, along with a couple of maybe a few dozen millionaires, really, are they're all exiled to Alaska. And there's a little more trouble in Canada, where the governor general apparently he doesn't really trust this. By the way, the governor general resides in Montreal <laughs> in this book. That's not a thing. And the French Canadians are not mentioned at all. So it's weird that he's living in Montreal and French Canadians yeah. not brought up. He seems to be like holding out for Britain, but then Tremaine he successfully cows him. And yeah, no, no mention of the people of Quebec whatsoever. So <laughs> Britain would rather deal with a czar and enemy sovereigns, though, than with the Anglo-Saxon Federation, who they declare to be a bunch of pirates. And not us had sort of suspected that this would happen, so it's like, Britain must go through the fire before true change can be enacted. And now there's a whole bunch of chapters depicting the overrunning of Britain and the Siege of London, which is the last bastion, and there's so much destruction. Uh, war balloons raining death on the towns, uh, French submarines helping to destroy the remains of the British fleet, uh, famine, pestilence ruling the day. It's kind of like the air battle again, but... Yeah, and this has the natural consequence of the global empire totally disintegrating. Contact yeah. with India and Australia are lost. The Atlantic telegraph cables, which were late in real life in 1865, have presumably been cut. And Britain is once again an isolated island. Right. For some reason, though, the Tsar still really cares about his pact with the American capitalists. It seems like he's sort of succeeded in this, his aim, so I don't really know why he's bothered. But he seems upset because they never contacted him or something. Yeah. And there's an envoy that arrives from the Federation, and he talks to the king. And there's the king of Britain, that is. it. Since this has been going on for so long now, he's he's sort of ready to capitulate. Um, the Anglo-Saxons, they say they will support the war if London can just hold out for long enough. And these ships from America, which is where the Anglo-Saxon Federation has their new base, have been built. All well, that industry is back in action and for the right cause this time. And they have a new style of explosive and projectile weapons, which are really powerful and can shoot, like, explosives really fast, I yeah. think. Here's uh, one point that he makes that, again, I wish he would have gone into more, but he says something to the effect that it doesn't matter how valiant the men defending the city are, this war is a war of machines. Right. Well, it's kind of like what I said earlier, like, yeah. World War I was kind of a war of machines, and I guess it was like... It's all how you see it, right? right? Because at the end of the day, I mean, there were some people who were like, wow, it's too bad that war's like this now. And then, then the other people were like, well, maybe we should just not have war. Yeah. Right? Like, maybe that's not a bad thing. Like, right. The technology's gotten so good now that we can just kill everybody no matter how valiant they are. Right. Exactly. That wasn't the case a thousand years ago. Yeah. Obviously. So Natas is very remorseless in his treatment of the Russians and... The Tsar thinks that he's been betrayed, so, you know, he's very upset, obviously. And Natas just has, like, airships and convoys from the, like, the Brotherhood side of the militaries just smash munitions dump and cause all kinds of chaos and an explosive power that decimates the Russians. And Tasha is even moved by this even though she's supposedly ruled by hatred still she's kind of like oh that's that's a lot of destruction do we have to do all this but the brotherhood is determined because they want this to be the last war on earth and they see no difference between war and murder which is something that arnold kind of said much earlier right. on right it's a very misguided concept that has a tendency to perpetuate itself the idea yeah. that there's going to be some war to end all wars the end justifies the means. Right. It's like something you see in a lot of, yeah, like, again, sort of a James Bond villain or, like, Doctor Who villain from the, the Pertwee or, or early Tom Baker years or something like that. Where yeah, it's like yeah. These deluded, sort of often upper-class people who have this idea of peace, but their idea of peace still sacrifices, like, everyone else. <laughs> right. So 
the French and Italians, they can be reasoned with, but never the Tsar. And Natas wants vengeance. And he says, actually, I think this is, this is something that, I'm not sure if a character says this, and I think it might just be Griffith. He says, the peoples of the world would be good enough friends if their rulers and politicians would let them. And, you know, that's something we see a lot. We're going to talk about Kipling shortly. And yeah. he said something similar. So even then, he's known as an imperialist. So you know, he's definitely not a socialist. Um, no. But, you know, it's just this whole thing where, like, it happened in the First World War. There's that, that famous incident of the Christmas in the trenches, you know, and everybody gave up their weapons and just played sports together. And, you know, it's it's kind of mythologized. But it's still this kind of cool moment of, like, hey, we don't have to do this right now kind right. of thing. And it's like it's kind of an uplifting story, I guess. Anyway, the Tsar's headquarters, the Russians are holding out bravely, and the Federation, who have their own uniforms now, I guess they just sort of, like, when they when they uh, they receive the signal, they put away their regular uniforms yeah. and go to their lockers and pull out their... They're master tailors in addition yeah. to being master pilots. <laughs> their gray Federation uniforms that have no, no standards on them. Right. So now the Tsar is essentially losing his empire because of all the, the backlash and the, the fact that a lot of his army is actually turned against him. And he finally surrenders. And it's a rather noble sight. So it's victory for the Anglo-Saxon race. Victory for the world! And for peace. And Natasha sings the international, the song of the revolution. In all languages, they're all singing together. And the Tsar and his generals are to be treated as criminals. And there's a court of the Brotherhood inner circle. And the King of England, of course, he hasn't been invited to anything. He's kind of unimportant now. And the Tsar, of course, he's standing proud. And he's saying, he's a king above all earthly laws. And Natas makes a thunderous speech against the Tsar and his despotism and all his cronies. And there is something personal that comes out in this. And we know that Natas cares more than... It's, it's, there's, it's definitely something personal. And he talks about how the Tsar and his rule separate a husband from his wife. And that's the most cruel thing. And I knew it. I knew this. I knew something like this was coming. <laughs> you know, it had to be. I thought it had to be this or, or Natas would truly turn out to be like evil at the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then he would be, because cause it just seemed like a lot of this, you know, how so blindly they follow him and how he mind controls a person and then tells him and the guy's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. Well, what was your plan again? Yeah, it, it just seemed like that could be a thing, but it's not. So here's Natas' goal. He wants to remove the Tsar and everybody associated with him. And the object is accomplished. So now... Natas sort of steps aside and he says, now it's the time of the Anglo-Saxon Federation to dominate the world. And this is more or less headed by Tremaine, the friend of Richard Arnold. Right, because it turns out that Colston, whose real name is Mazanov, is Russian and he yeah. doesn't have any English blood in him. So that makes him, of course, unsuitable to lead this Anglo-Saxon federation. Yeah, but he's still happy. Yeah. Because he gets to marry Radna, I guess, so... Right. And he gets to serve the British, who are, you know, the greatest people in the, the world. The greatest and people why, in the universe. Why wouldn't you be privileged to right. be part Why of wouldn't that? you be happy about that? Yeah. So, the Supreme Council takes the place of more or less all governments, and yeah. the world is going to be ruled by truth and justice from now on, thanks to Satan. Yeah. <laughs> and Europe is apportioned out. Property is declared to be public. So they're having a meeting to discuss all this. And the Kaiser makes some actually pretty good points as to why things might not work out. But he's just sort of shouted down and it doesn't make any difference. Lawyers are abolished. All of them. Because any law that's so complex that it needs specialized people to understand it isn't worth anything. Anyway. And all warships are destroyed, except those of the Anglo-Saxon Federation. There is mandatory defensive service for men aged 20 to 40, 
And we get some talk of Muslims and Africans that's rather perfunctory. And finally, we get the story of Natas. He just sort of decides to spill the beans to Tremaine, I think it is. Yeah. And he talks about how he's a Hungarian Jew who fought against the mistreatment of the Jewish people in Russia, which was a real thing. Oh, very real. Very problematic at the time. And it's interesting that Griffith, I guess, chose this as the linchpin of sort of the, the focal point of why things happened and because yeah i'm and not sure i'm not sure that most of the british public would have been that terribly concerned with the fate of russian jews i don't probably know probably not but probably not it's yeah. something that i wish he did more with again like why is this the last proper chapter in i know the book before the epilogue it makes here's no another sense novel that he didn't write yeah 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 so he made himself a nuisance for the police and they had it out for him and there's this sham arrest and they plant a cipher on him that, that makes it seem like he's a spy. And he gets sent to Siberia and he's treated really terribly there. A guard destroys his face and breaks his spine and it's it's really bad. But then he gets released just like that. And there's some kind of sort of not that convincing explanation for why like he just suddenly gets released. Yeah. I mean, I guess at least he didn't die in captivity, right? But I don't know. So, and this is where he joins the Brotherhood, and it's already existent. Uh, he rises through the ranks, and even though he didn't create the Brotherhood, he did create the Terror. So, that's the story of Natas. And, of course, he had a wife, too. And she was a Christian, and she was also imprisoned. And they were going to try and reunite, but she didn't make it. And so, he was left bereft very angry with the Tsar. We go a little bit more into the Muslims, and it's still kind of rather perfunctory. Uh, there's a bit more stuff with the Muslims in the next book, apparently, but it's just sort of written off here. Essentially, they fight very nobly, but when they recognize the superior firepower and abilities of the Anglo-Saxon armies, they don't really stand a chance. And Natasha and Arnold are finally wed, and she has a baby. And the Tsar dies before he can begin his proper sentence in Siberia. Possibly of a broken heart. Yeah, though in real life he died of kidney failure in 1894. <laughs> yeah, not long after the book was written. Right. And the next Tsar was not really a lot like him, I no. don't think. No. Uh, not, not a strong ruler, anyway, by all accounts. But that is how we end the great struggle of 1904-5, and also the book The Angel of the Revolution. Yeah, I think that the epilogue is pretty much Griffith talking directly to the reader about what he would kind of like to see in the world, as well as the political divisions and stuff like that. And and there is a lot of, I guess, rote socialism, anyway, expressed there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know. I mean, the whole Anglo-Saxon thing, like, is definitely... It feels really incongruous with any socialistic message. Yeah, even it as... puts paid to any notion that this is progressive. Yeah, really. Right. I mean, even the socialist movements at the time would have not been in favor of like an ethno state. <laughs> yeah. If Herbert, if Herbert George Wells had read this book, he would have been like, "I have to give you a talking to." Yeah. He would yeah. have had something to say, <laughs> I think, about this. Not to say, you know, that I mean, he was obviously, in some ways perhaps fond of his homeland as well and why shouldn't he be but like this kind of jingoistic like well i mean the british obviously deserve to rule everything the anglo-saxon right. federation right, not to course, mention yeah. america Mer america would just like once they hear about what's really going on they're obviously going to join their british brothers right of course yeah and again there's no no mention anybody else that migrated to america you know no mention of the germans no mention of like Eastern Europeans or, 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 or the black population never mind, America. African American. Yeah, right. 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 Uh, it, None yeah. of these people get mentioned. Um, yeah. It's kind of insulting, really. It's yeah. like, oh, all the past, you know, like all that was for nothing, right? Like we just, hey, by the way, you're ruled by a bunch of capitalists. Don't you want to <laughs> give it up for the yeah. Anglo Saxon Federation? Right. Yeah, sure. That's what we're all here for. Yeah. It's a very, I don't know, superficial, silly surface level novel. It's really inconsistent at any kind of political messaging. And I think he was going more for just entertainment yeah. and maybe using some of the frame as a way to 
express certain opinions, but I don't think he was trying to tie them together, or at least no. he didn't succeed in tying them together in any meaningful way. To be fair, I mean, we're not criticizing this book uh, because it's old and, you know, outdated in morality or anything. I think that this is, in fact, you can trace a, a really nice through line between books like this and, and, like, more modern stuff by people like Tom Clancy and Dan sure, Brown yeah. and stuff like that. To be honest with you, their books are similarly lacking in real political nuance, Yeah, but they are entertaining. And in some right. ways, perhaps more entertaining from this book than this book because i think maybe yeah. those authors have learned a little bit about the fact that you need to write even if you don't do it that well and you just make it like some cheesy romantic subplot or whatever you have to make your characters memorable i guess and this yeah. book doesn't There's do a very good job no characterization in this novel at all and it's a shame because I thought it was really going to different places with the whole opening setup of the russian adventure uh, i thought yeah. we would get to see arnold and natasha more fleshed out as people but they're never got into as right. characters it's like at, you at said all, there's really. like six whole novels in here yeah and most of them are like truncated like they're yeah. like you get the beginning and then he just sort of cuts off yeah. and goes to something else and then he'll maybe mention briefly in passing oh this happened in the other place and like it's just not it's not very satisfying because like it almost seems like the things that you're led up to expect, you get excited about. Maybe what that's what the first time that happened to me was the six month time jump where they go to Russia and right. it's like they're going to the land of the enemy, right? Let's yeah. hear about the Tsar's court. Let's hear about like right, yeah, right. You know exactly. them playing all these roles and Arnold not knowing Russian and what's going to happen, right? Right. We don't hear anything about it. It's just, yeah. yeah, you know, it's totally and, skipped. Yeah, yeah, and he's built these airships like in Russia in secret. Because don't forget, they don't have area by this point, so they don't have a base, really, right. to build stuff like this from. Yeah. Or maybe they build some of them in England. Yeah, I think they build... I can't remember if the area was built in England or Russia. But it could go either way. Like, that's just how how this book is. Like, they have enough... Griffith would say, you know, he would want us to believe, okay, Russia is the enemy, the Tsar is, like, all-powerful and evil but there's still enough brotherhood people there that they can just do all this stuff under their noses and get away with it and i don't know it's like nothing nothing really seems like a credible threat to any of the characters and you yeah. know he talks about like hundreds of thousands of people dying and that's like nothing but like our main characters you know they're just no sense of danger right they're pretty much right. invincible action heroes and n well, not, even... pawn, not only that they're pawns that are pushed around by not us. yeah right yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's poorly plotted. It doesn't come together with any of the plot points, even though it does have some cool stuff scattered throughout. It is way too long. Like, he could have cut this in half easily and. Yeah, it's not frustrating, lost though, because if he yeah. did, it probably wouldn't be better. Right. Right. Well, yeah, I guess, but still. Yeah, because, like, a lot of the criticisms that, that I have are, like, it's weird because it is long and it's really long. But a yeah. lot of the criticisms that I have are like, well, why don't we get more of this? Yeah. Right? So well, am I, I guess... really suggesting the book be padded out to 800 pages? No, I, I don't really think so. But it's just weird. Like, it's, it's all the emphasis is on the stuff that we wouldn't like it to be on, I guess. Yeah. So. Now, if you spent more time on these individual plot points and made those into satisfying stories rather than these little episodes that just kind of feel randomly pasted together. I think he'd have a more satisfying work. I agree. I agree. So we've now read three sort of air war novels. Yeah. And I don't think we're going to be reading the sequel here. But if you are interested in what happens next, the Apocalypse podcast, do an episode on Siren of the Skies. So yeah, it's a pretty fun episode. Yeah. yeah. I enjoyed listening to it. I did listen to it in preparation for this. They go a little bit into Angel of the Revolution. I guess one of the two hosts did read the book, but it's mostly about the sequel, so... Yeah, but we won't be covering that here, and I don't know if we're going to be covering any of his other works that remains to be seen, but I don't no. know, this one wasn't the greatest for me. So, I mean, if it had been made into a film, though, it would have probably been pretty cool if it yeah. was in the right hands. Yep, I agree. We've read three Arab more war kind of books. I don't know about you, but I think that our exploration of aviation is definitely missing something. Yes. Yeah, I agree. What do you think it's missing? Well, like I said, the commercial aspect 
of aviation didn't come in until well after World War I. And our next author foresees the use of aviation in civilian life and how that would affect day-to-day -day people. Right. And all I can say is it's about time somebody addressed this. <laughs> in a moment, we're going to say hello to Sir Roger Kipling. Mm -hmm.